Thad Brown along with Carl Jones is another eight sports extra. Today we're going to talk about what do the Bills do with the cap space they are about to gain when the Trey White June 1st uh, release actually kicks in. You, you think about a June 1st release, you always think, oh, that's someday miles in the future. Well, it's this weekend, you know, so it's, it's going to happen soon. I think technically the money does not become available until June 2nd. But who cares for the point of this conversation, whether you're hearing this May 31st, June 2nd, June 4th, it's still the same conversation. So, you know, Carl, I think the number one thought I have and why I want to talk about this is Brandon Bean doesn't do things without a plan. There is some reason why this offseason, for the most part, he took his money, he took his lumps this year with the cap and tried to clean things up for next year, except for this one move and one other Dawson Knox got his contract restructured, whatever. Most of the moves have been saving money for next year and eating it this year. This move was not that. So why take this $10 million and save it for now? I know that the Bills do get a little more cap room with this move because if you had just made the cut and not done a June 1st version of it, the Bills would have gotten cap relief earlier, but it would have been less. Regardless, why do we think Brandon Bean wanted to have this $10 million come free June the 2nd? I think he wants some wiggle room. And I, I think last year with all of the, I don't want to say catastrophes, but like all of the things stuff that they had to deal with midseason last year with the injuries and things of that nature, there was less wiggle room in terms of maneuvers you can make outside of a, a veteran minimum mm-hmm. signing, things of that nature. So I think it's a little bit intriguing that they can, we're going to dive into it, but 10 million is not chump change. And I, and I know that once you talk about what they have to do with the 10 million come June 1st, it may not be as much. But it will provide you a little bit of a relief to do things in season outside of just a regular veteran minimum signing. Now, I think there are things the Bills can do, which is what we're going to talk about here. Let's first lay out where they are salary cap-wise. Right now, they have about $2 million in space. They're going to get $10 million more June the 2nd. Now, $12 million is a nice number. I mean, in Buffalo, that's like oodles, you know. But in the league, that would rank them about 18th. So – it's not like the Bills are going to be the only team that suddenly have cap space and all these unsigned players are going to flock to Buffalo because it's the only place they can find money. There are other teams that have money that could spend on any of these players we're going to talk about if they wanted to. But obviously, Buffalo's a unique situation. They're a Super Bowl contender, good team, so they're going to have some more advantages that would be attractive with the extra space. However, that $12 million cannot all just be used for whatever the Bills want to do. A, they're going to need about $2.1 million for rookies and – since this is a podcast and we have unlimited time, I'll dive in quick to the weeds here of how that works. The rookies, the 10 players the Bills picked, are going to cost in total about $10 million. But only the top 51 players count against the cap. So let's say the Bills sign a player, one of the rookies, for a $1 million. Well, one of the guys who already already count as one of those 51, they're making like eight hundred fifty grand. So the increase to the cap is only the, 100, the difference, one hundred fifty grand in this theoretical uh, situation. That's why the total gain is 2.1-ish. So, back to the big picture, the 12 million the Bills are going to have this weekend really is only a little less than 10. And then on top of that, kind of to what you talked about, you need to have wiggle room during the season. You can't spend every dime in case you have five injuries at one position. So let's say, Carl, for the sake of this discussion, the Bills might have somewhere between 5 and 7 million to spend. What's the first thing that most fans are thinking about getting? It's a wide receiver, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the sexy thing, right? Go, yeah. go, go, go get another toy for Josh Allen. And when you look at the receivers available on the market, free agency, not too appealing considering what you already have on the roster. You're, you're kind of diving in the same bin what you already have. But then the fans are like, I don't know. I see Justin Jefferson rumors. I see Brandon Ayuk's unhappy. I don't know. T. Higgins is still out there. And – one, you'll dive into this. Their base salaries won't really mesh up to them for them to be in Buffalo. And also, Jettis is not going nowhere, Justin Jefferson. They, they got a rookie quarterback. Justin Jefferson is literally going to walk into the office. I saw what t- uh, Jalen Waddle got today. He's going to walk in there and say, hey, here's $40 million. Come sign it. Like, that's exactly what he's going to do, and the Vikings are going to mess around. I feel the same way with Brandon Ayuk. T. Higgins, uh, the way that the Bengals have kind of maneuvered their offseason, this is an all-in year for them, so – Sounds like a good dream, but I don't think it's happening. And with T. Higgins specifically, the Bengals are not helping out an AFC rival. You know, the Niners and Vikings might, the the Bengals won't. But going back to what you said before, the big problem with the big-ticket receiver ad is that most of the big-ticket receivers you'd have to trade for, and all of their base salaries currently are so big that the Bills could not afford it. 
when you hear about a player being traded salary cap wise, the bonuses and the the stuff that was prorated and you know all those things that were void years pushed down the road, that stuff all is what the original team. So in this case, let's say Brandon Ayuk, the Niners would have to eat that on their cap if they ever traded Ayuk. Now Ayuk doesn't have like any of that right now. The base salary though transfers to the new team, so the Bills would have to have the room to add Brandon Ayuk and his base salary because he's on a fifth year option is fourteen million or something. The Bills would have to have fourteen million available on their cap right now to fit him. Now, technically, they would have twelve million on June the second. And what you can do if you're the Bills is you could cut or restructure guys and create room. The problem is, at this point in the offseason, what the Bills already did to get under the cap, they would have to restructure probably three guys to be able to fit in any of these receiver contracts. So you take the fact that the actual functionality of the salary cap to get a receiver trade done is minimal. And then on top of that, the other thing I think of, they added Chase Claypool. They added MVS. They added Quintus Cephas and already cut him. They've got K.J. Hamler running around. If they were going to make a wide receiver trade, why are you signing all the other guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've had, they already have so many guys who like are competing for roster spots at this point. Like You added all those guys, not including Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, Shakir who's already on the roster. you got Keon Coleman. That's like eight guys. Andy Isabella, excuse me, forgot about him too. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean – Justin Shorter, can't forget about Justin Shorter. He's still on the team as well. So, like, that's like eight, nine guys right there. If you would have made, if you wanted a Brandon Ayuk, if you wanted one of these, even a Cortland Sutton, who obviously has a big base salary as well. He, by the way, would be the, the one the most likely to get done. He's got the smallest base. Yeah. And I think also the probably the most reasonable to be traded. Because you brought up Ayuk and Jefferson. Those guys are probably staying with their current teams. They're too good. Sutton is not quite that good. I, I think if you were going to go down the road of the pipe dream receiver trade, Cortland Sutton's the guy for me. Yeah, and, and also the Broncos are the one team in transition, so they mm -hmm. wouldn't be opposed to getting some draft capital for a guy who's probably not in their long-term plans. But I know it's cute, it's sexy. Man, another toy for Josh Allen. Don't know if the next two months is the route that you need to begin your dreams of, uh, over, especially with the wide receiver position. Now, what the Bills could do is what they did last year at this time, which is spend big on a pass rusher. You know, that – or, or obviously another player, and we're going to talk about different players that the Bills could go with. But that was what they did with this money this year. And, you know, if I'm thinking back to the original part or the, the start of this discussion, which is Brandon Bean has a plan, I do wonder if the plan was a pass rusher. But, Carl, let me, let me start with let's, – let's talk about some guys the Bills can sign. And you can start with pass rusher if you want or go some other way. But if you were going to spend – if you're the Bills and you're going to spend this new cap space on a player – what position, what guys, where are you looking right now? There are three positions where I'm like, this money should be catered towards first. Uh, I think edge is probably second on my list. I think corner is probably the top. And then it was a mixture of, I man, I guess four positions. It was a mixture of either guard or running back because they still don't have a pass blocking running back. We'll get to that in a second. But there are some guys, Emmanuel Agua is still out there. Carl Lawson is still out there. Yannick Ngakwe is still out there. Guys who are still available. Calais Campbell, I know he's up there in age, but he's still a productive pl uh, player at this point in his career. So wouldn't be opposed to them adding a guy there. It's just that when you look at the roster, so they have their four guys. That is A.J. Epinesa, Gregory Rousseau, Von Miller, and then um, Dwayne Smoot, who they already added. Your fifth, your fifth defensive end, you usually only dress five or six. You presume it's going to be Javon Solomon, the guy you just drafted, your fifth-round pick. And if he's not, then you, you're going to put him on waivers if you cut him. So like that's the, the – the, the limit that they're in. Now, granted, you take quality players if you can get them. You don't right. care. You worry about the back end of the roster later. But that is the predicament that you're in. The guy that you're bringing in, you better hope that he's clear in levels above Dwayne Smoot and Javon Solomon. See, like, Yannick Ngakwe, to me, is the, the big name, the impact guy. And this is a guy that's had uh, eight-plus sacks, not last year, but the six years before that. So he's been consistent. Now, I'd be concerned with him because – He's also played for six teams in the last five years, which is kind of ridiculous. He gets traded more than middle relievers do. Um, if you were going to go edge, though, the reason I would think about this is that of all the guys available in the free agent market, and maybe just because of the position where they play, this is where you could have an impact. I mean, like a guy like Carl Lawson, who really never worked with the Jets, when the Jets signed him, they thought of him as a number one elite edge rusher. And, and I still think that, you know, maybe – that ceiling is still in his bag somewhere. I don't see that. You, you, we'll go through any other name you want. 
I don't think there's another position group, certainly, and certainly not another name, that you could have that kind of impact. I really like the Lawson idea, though. And, and your point about not having jerseys to dress the guy is reasonable, but you don't have to keep Dwayne Smoot around. You know, I mean, you just signed him. Pretty sure it was a one-year deal, but I'm thinking off the top of my head. Um, obviously, the Bills talk about needing competition, stuff like that. that that'll be an argument, too. But, you know, if you talk about where the Bills want to be in January, who they want to be, Carl Austin's a guy that can make that happen. Theoretically, their defensive line, I think, is the biggest thing that's kind of kept them from taking the step that they wanted to take. Um, I think that's the position that also has the clearest pathway to an impact. Like if they were to sign a guard, he's competing for with David Edwards. I don't know if he's going to start the running back idea. He's purely just your Latavius Murray uh, pass blocking guy on third down. And then in your cornerback, you hope never sees the field. Right. So like, he probably will based off of like the attrition of an NFL football season. But you hope he doesn't. The defensive end you sign, you hope he plays and is very productive. So I think that is, if there is a position where you want to acquire the guy and spend the most of this $10 million, I think that will be the position. And the way the Bills rotate defensive ends, the guy's going to play if he makes the team. Let's move to the defensive backfield, though. Um, talk to me about what names stand out to you as a guy that could at least be helpful, maybe if not go all the way towards having a major impact. So the, you're gonna look at the big name games, big name uh, names, excuse me, at corner, and you're gonna be like, man, there's some guys who can help. Yeah, I thought so too. J.C. Jackson, Xavier Howard, Stephen Nelson, Stephon Gilmore. I don't think any of those guys. I think those guys are available for a reason. I think they're finding situations where they can play immediately, and I don't think that situation is here in Buffalo. But there was a guy who I actually was intrigued with, Akello Weatherspoon, Weatherspoon, excuse me. Spent last year with the Rams. He's bounced around a bit. He was with Pittsburgh before, and then uh, San Francisco to start his career. Big rangy guy. He's at sixth floor thrives in a zone scheme, and I think that would be a good fit for what the Bills like to do um, schematically on defense. He's been a starter everywhere he's been, so I don't know if he's still seeking that role, but he's 29. Like, I don't know how many starting opportunities you're going to get. So I think if he comes in and competes with Kyrie Elam for CB3, I think that's ideal. He wouldn't be expensive at all. He's probably a vet men guy at this point, considering the other cornerbacks that are on the market. Right. So I think that would be a guy who I would target in terms of cornerbacks. And I think that's – if you're going to make a move for a corner – CB3 is what the Bills want. You know, I think they feel pretty good about the starters with Christian Benford and Russell Douglas. They don't blow the world away, but they're, they're solid guys. But the depth there is lacking. I mean, you know, the Bills are one injury from reliving the Kyrie Elam experience every single week of the season, which, look, I know fans are kind of split on what kind of player he can be, but it hasn't worked out so far in Buffalo. A lot of those names on there are guys who are 30 and over, and, and I, I would try to avoid that if I'm Buffalo for a lot of reasons. Steven Nelson's not, though. That was the guy, like, if, you wanted, if I was going to pick a corner, he was the one that I thought would potentially have the most impact. This guy's played some nickel, right? So versatility there, too. You're right that maybe he's holding out for a starting job. But if you can get him in to, you know, to be a part of this team, it would be ridiculous depth. You know, so Nelson was my favorite name off that list in terms of corners available. I think a lot of those corners are going to wait until camp, though, because some of these guys around the league are going to get hurt. Right. And I think that's the time where some of these names are going to fly off the board. And, and I know some other guys, Cam Sutton has his own legal issues, so I'm going to ignore that one. Even Patrick Peterson is still available. So there are a bunch of guys, especially Xavier Howard, who I think, even James Bradbury, we'll get to the, like, I'll talk about the guys who get cut in a minute, but, like, they just drafted two corners in the first two rounds. I think he's a clear-cut candidate, but I don't think he's coming to Buffalo because I believe he wants to play, so... The next three months, I think, are going to be musical chairs, especially at corner. Let's talk about safety for a minute. You talk about big names. Yeah. The big name that's available right now is safety Justin Simmons. You know, and it's funny. The, the Bills made sure to cover their bases because you, you lose Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde. You have to have – you can't go into the draft with that big an opening at, at safety. So you re-sign Taylor Rapp, you bring in Mike Edwards, and then they were able to make a, you know, a, a, an interesting draft pick in the second round with Cole Bishop. Do you wonder at all if Brandon Bean looks back and thinks – Man, the safety market. It's not just him. Marcus May is out there. There's at least one more guy I can't think of off the top of my head. There are safeties available. Name safeties to where, like, if the Bills had a, didn't draft Cole Bishop or didn't sign Mike Edwards and added Justin Simmons right now, it would change your viewpoint of what this defense could be. Yeah, I mean, Eddie Jackson, Quandre Diggs, yeah. these are all players who have been highly productive players in the National Football League. And... I understand Justin Simmons wants to get paid, and rightfully so. He got cut from the Broncos. He was up for a big year this year in terms of salary. I don't think Buffalo's that place because, once again, I think he wants a clear-cut pathway to the field. He's an older guy, so he's probably trying to just, like, save his body a little bit and come around training camp, do the old Brett Favre thing where he just pulls up in July and, uh, and save the wear and tear on legs. But guys of that nature, you're like, man, like, 
I think all three of those guys are probably better than what they have now, but you you just got away, got rid of older safeties. Are you willing to dibble dabble in, in that department again? Justin Simmons might be the exception because he didn't look like an older guy last year compared to the other two guys, but those names are out there and they're they're very appealing to look at. I'll tell you that the age point you made kind of quashes the thing I was going to say to you just now, which is. Are we sure Justin Simmons doesn't have a clear path to start in Buffalo? I mean, are any of those three guys someone that you would rather start over Justin Simmons this September? Now, there's reasons you want to build. You know, obviously Cole Bishop's a rookie. You want to develop him. And and I think, uh, you know, a lot of fans have talked about, wow, you know, they brought in Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer kind of as semi-nobodies, and they became great safeties. Why can't you do the same with Taylor Rapp and Mike Edwards? And there's lots of reasons for that. That's a whole different podcast. But it's not totally ridiculous to think it. Regardless... If, let's say Justin Simmons knocked on Brandon Bean's door and said, you know what, I'll play for $3 million this year. Wouldn't Brandon Bean have to sign that guy and just say, you know what, I know we said this and gave this and drafted this, but this guy can play and help us right now. You literally tell Justin Simmons, lock the door behind you, call your agent, you're staying here and you're not going back home. Mm -hmm. Tell your wife and family, we'll get them on a flight. You're not, we'll start looking for real estate here in Orchard Park. You don't let someone like that leave the building. He might not be the Pro Bowl player he once was in his prime, but he's not too far behind it. Like, those days aren't too long gone, I'll tell you that. Especially in a Denver defense that was – they gave up 73 points in a game last year. <laughs> 70. And he wasn't the problem, I'll tell you that. So he's still a, a very very productive player who is much better than Rap Edwards and then you presume a rookie at this point. So, as we pointed out, there's a lot of realistic reasons why Justin Simmons is not going to end up in Buffalo this year. But guys who could – like we said, I think the number one need from the Bills' side would be depth of corner. If, I, if you just said the Bills are going to add a veteran somewhere, where would you say? I'd say corner. We're corner one and then maybe edge two. Yes. Three, though, and you pointed this out, interior offensive line. I think the difference with this discussion is corner and safety, there's a ridiculous amount of good names. I really had trouble coming up with an interior, and obviously interior offensive linemen are probably the bottom of barrel when it comes to names. But – even for that comparison, there really aren't guys that you can come in and say, wow, he'd be a great addition in the middle of the Bills' offensive line. The name that I stumbled upon, and it was interesting for a, a, a bunch of different reasons, but it was Connor Williams, the guy, uh, the center for the Dolphins last year, who came towards the ACL this past December, and he's a free agent, for, I imagine, for a lot of reasons. He wants to recover on his own dime and make sure that he finds the best fit for him. But he was a guard prior to being in Miami. So he has experience between being a center and guard all over the interior. So if you're the Bills, you come to him and say, hey, man, you can sit out training camp. We'll give you a base of four, one year, whatever, see how you feel. And if you're healthy around October, November, battle for David Edwards. I mean, I guess you're not battling at that point in the season, but if David Edwards is not performing up to standards, you have a guy who, according to PFS, has been a clear 75-ish guy his entire career in the NFL, which is a solid player. So I think Connor Williams is probably seeking a starting spot when he comes back from injury, but he's someone who piqued my interest for sure. The one name that I, I liked the best was Mark Lewinsky, who has been a starter with the Giants uh, and the Colts. Um, last year, he did not start as much. So, you know, he's not a super old guy, but perhaps is transitioning to being a depth veteran ad in the league. He's still available. To me, he almost feels like kind of the really poor man's version of the Justin Simmons conversation we had, which is, yeah, if he shows up and says he'll play for $3 million, sure, but you're probably not getting that guy for it. Greg Van Roten is available if the Bills want to go down that road. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Beyond Williams and, and Glowinski, you know, the, the names that you're, you're discussing would be the same stuff the Bills have had in, in the interior. Now, I think the Bills, from their point of view, they put Alec Anderson on this roster last year. They probably feel like him, him along with Cedric Van Pan Granger, the, uh, the fifth-round draft pick, that's your interior depth. Will Clapp is on this team, too, who's a veteran guy. I, I can't say I'm excited about any of that. I was surprised Anderson made the team last year. Uh, you know, Granger is a fifth-round pick. That is what it is. And, uh, you know, Will Clapp is – the, the definition of replacement level players. So, uh, you know, I think there's a good argument for adding there, but I think the Bills would say we have these guys and probably feel good about that already. Yeah, at that point, I guess, but I mean, you roll in with David Edwards and you're presuming he's a starter, but I think they have enough competent bodies there, especially they're set at the other four positions. They wouldn't be opposed to, you don't want to have a Rolodex at left guard, but if that's the position where we have a little bit of issue there, I think they have enough bodies on the position, on the roster, excuse me, to kind of, 
figure it out. You know, kind of where, where you're going with this a little bit is, you know, the Bills always talk about competition. We want competition everywhere, every spot. They don't really have a single bit of competition on the offensive line right now. I mean, there is no one in this roster who I can think would reasonably challenge Dion, Edwards, McGovern, Cyrus, and Spencer Brown. I mean, the, you know, maybe Lyle Collins, depending on how healthy he is. Right, I've, but the health is his concern, and you hope he's not competing with Spencer Brown. Right. Like, like, that, <laughs> like we pray he's not competing with Spencer Brown for a spot. Which is a good argument for maybe adding somebody. When, when, yeah. you, when you, I mean, you could say that about everybody who's a backup on this team, except for the rookie because he's never done anything in the league before. There is not a single backup that you look at and say, oh, they'll be fine if that guy has to play. You know, um, maybe Ryan Vandermark a little bit because he actually got a few snaps last year. But, you know, I think there's a good argument. If, if you're a competition team and the Bills have said it left and right, offensive line could use some competition because you don't really have any right now. That left guard spot sticks out like a sore thumb. David Edwards is, I think his sample size is, what, five starts? I mean, in he was a starter with the Rams quite a bit. Yeah, so so he, he's got, point. yeah, yeah. That's a spot that I think sticks out like a sore thumb for sure. No, you're not wrong about that. All right. So I think that's pretty much the limit of if you're going to add a guy, that's where we'd add. But you kind of hinted at this. You're talking about James Bradbury. And, and you might not have a need now, but you might have needs or you might have players available come the end of August at the end of training camp. Yeah. I, I mean, you look around the league, and there are certain position groups that are stacked. You think of the Eagles. You just drafted two rookies. Um, Darius Slay is getting up there in age. I, they're not cutting Darius Slay, I imagine. So James Bradbury would be the odd man out. If he wants to come and compete in Buffalo, something happens to Christian Benford, Rasul Douglas in camp, that is someone you can target. Traylon Burks has been the, the talk of social media for quite some time now, and I understand why. I mean, I don't think he's playing over Tyler Boyd, Calvin Ridley, who you just paid, or DeAndre Hopkins. So I think there's a path. A very difficult path, to say the least. Yeah, so that is someone who, hey, if you want to take a flyer on him, I think Terrace Marshall, I think is another intriguing guy as well. Yeah, the young guy out of Carolina, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Joe Brady coached him at LSU in 2019, the fantastic year. So – that is someone who Joe Brady has had firsthand experience with. Clearly, he's not opposed to taking guys like that because he coached Curtis Samuel. So those are a couple guys that I thought of that were like their position around the league might change between now and the end of training camp, who the Bills might at least like scroll at and be like, hmm, we'll see about it. And I think that's where I want to kind of conclude this discussion with. When you talk about what is the best way to use this money, the best way to use this money is to not use this money, you know, to save it. Forget about – who might be available or where we might discuss the Bills could have a need for a player, there's going to be guys who are going to get hurt, whether it's in Buffalo or elsewhere. Things are going to change. The view of who's available and what the Bills want or need will change between now and the end of August. I think the best way, and I want to hear what you think the best way to use this money is, even if the same answer, the best way for the Bills to use this money is to save it and see what might be available or what you might need at the end of training camp, maybe even, you know, to make a move at the trade deadline, you know, in, in uh, late October, instead of spending it now on a guy where, you know, we could use a little help here, you know, you're not looking for a starter anywhere. And, and you're not going to find, as we've talked about, much impact from what's available, certainly not in positions where the Bills are going to be have a desire to add someone. So to me, I think the Bills don't do anything with this money other than sign their draft picks. I got two things for you. One, I like a killer weather spoon. He's a Batman guy, so go get him. So that's first. Uh, secondly, though, I, I will say that it is the uh, the approach that I would take as well. I mean, think of Rasul Douglas last year. You lose Trey White, in, uh, I believe, in week four. four. Week four. You needed money to go acquire a guy like a Rasul Douglas, and if you spend it all, let's say, within the next three weeks or so, you won't have the capabilities to get a competent starter in this league if a position like if an injury to a position like that happens. So I'm right with you on that one. Who knows if – a team gets disgruntled, they're out of the playoff race, they're willing to sell and sell some guys off for the cheap. you got some extra draft picks this upcoming, this upcoming year to finagle a little bit. I think I, that was the move I would take as well. Yeah, you'd have, you'd have ammunition. You'd have the draft picks and some cap room at least to make that move. And, again, you know, going back to guys we talked about before, if you blow $5 million on Carl Lawson and then he's inactive, as he was with the Jets last year, many games, and now you don't have that space for when you have an emergency somewhere or multiple emergencies, as the Bills have had the last couple of years, you know, you're going to feel pretty stupid. So, yeah, I think although it's going to be exciting and it's, it's exciting relative to early June in the NFL world, I don't think the Bills really – it makes any sense for them to use that money exorbitantly right off the bat. Ain't it crazy the NFL got us excited about June 1st cuts? 
the NFL really like dominates the whole year. The whole year, man. man. They've done a good deal. Credit to the NFL. <laughs> you know, we're gonna do we're gonna have an eighteen week season soon. Super Bowl's gonna be the last week of February. It's gonna be Super Bowl, week off, combine, week off, free agency for like three weeks, <laughs> draft, week off, schedule comes out. I mean now the the thing is when they if they move OTAs to July, what you're gonna have is uh, after the schedule comes out mid May, you're gonna have that window for about a month, which right. would be kind of the dead period, you know. Which would be the, I mean, I guess it would be the worst idea. That is NHL and NBA playoffs right. concluding. You know, let let them have that little window. Do we think the NFL care about letting, letting anyone else well, get shy? Again, they're, they're not going <laughs> to. You wonder what they're going to put in there, right? Is that when they're going to start playing preseason games? You know, the NFL flag football league will be like Memorial Day. Weekend Don't give them day. no ideas. Don't give them no ideas. <laughs> all right. As always, you can check out uh, all these items on 8 Sports Extra at rochesterfirst.com. You Mouse over to the sports tab and click on 8 Sports Extra. We've got all kinds of stuff here. We rank the AFC East by division, worth checking out too, or by position, I should say. Um, that's worth checking out as well. For Carl Jones, I'm Thad Brown. Thanks for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time on 8 Sports Extra.